Thanks for leading us in worship this morning, and we're excited about uh, continuing our time uh, through the Word. So if you have a Bible with you, let me encourage you to open up to John chapter 3. We're in John chapter 3 this morning, and where the title of the sermon is, The Sin of Comparison. The Sin of Comparison. How many of you feel encouraged already? you just already, I feel blessed. I feel encouraged to be here. Well, I hope you enjoy our time in the Word. It's been a joy for Lisa and I to be with you. Thanks for letting us come. For many of you, we met you yesterday at the marriage conference, and some of you have seen it ascend camp from the, uh, the earlier this summer, but it's just a real honor. I like Kansas. Kansas is nice. Nice people, nice weather, and a great church. So what a joy to be here with Bart and with Steve Crawford, another good friend of mine over the years. And so it's what a joy to be here. Again, we're in John chapter 3. Three, verses 22 through 30. Let me read our text and then we'll jump into our time together. Here's what the Apostle John writes. He says, After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he re- remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now, a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, and I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease." Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to sing songs and to hear the public reading of the Scripture from Psalm 48. Thank you for our text here in John 3. Pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to learn what you want us to learn from your Word this morning so that we can live it out in humility and in faith. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let me start off this morning by telling you a story about a guy by the name of Marty. He walked out onto the street and he managed to grab a taxi that was just going by. And as he jumps into the taxi, the cab driver says to him, perfect timing, you're just like Dave. Who? Marty asked. Dave Anderson, the taxi driver said. There's a guy who did everything right, like my coming along when you needed a cab. It would have happened that way for Dave. There's always a few clouds over everybody, said Marty. The taxi driver said, not Dave. He was a terrific athlete. He could have gone on to the pro tour in tennis. He he could golf with the pros. He was an absolutely incredible swimmer. He sang like an opera star and he danced on Broadway. He was really something, huh? He had a memory like a trap. He could remember everybody's birthday. He he knew all about wine and which fork to eat with. He could fix anything. Not like me. I change a fuse and black out the whole neighborhood. Well, no wonder you remember him. Well, I actually never met Dave. Then how do you know so much about him, asked Marty. Because I married his widow. That's what happens, right? Sometimes you get compared to everyone else. And if we're not careful, we can become somewhat intimidated by those who have gone before us. I mean, have you ever felt that way about some type of job you've been in or ministry you've been in that you never quite measure up to the standard of the person before you? It can be very frustrating. And we look around and we see people who have achieved such great things in their professional lives and in their family lives and even in their spiritual lives. And we all feel sometimes very inadequate. Or maybe it's others who make comparisons to us that make us feel that way. They're always telling us that we don't quite measure up to the former person who was in that same position. And if you compare yourself with others, you can always find someone greater than you, and you can always find someone lesser than you, right? Most of us are somewhere in the middle, and yet we all struggle with that 
sin of comparison. In fact, hold your place in John 3. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 just to see this one verse that states very clearly what it is we're trying to accomplish in our sermon this morning. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 12 and notice this one verse what Paul says there to the church of Corinth. He says this, he says, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves. But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. So what Paul is saying is, if you want good understanding, realize who you are in Christ. But if you spend your life comparing yourself with others, and you take time to measure yourself by comparison with another person, then you don't really understand what the gospel is all about. You don't really understand who you are in Christ. It's not about comparing yourselves to others. It's about being who God's called you to be as a blood-bought child of God and doing your work for Him. And we don't have to feel inadequate because God fills us with his Holy Spirit. And wherever we're lacking, God provides the measure of strength that he wants for us in that moment. And so this sermon, you can go back to John 3, this sermon is all about the sin of comparison. And this morning, I want to give you five headings that will help you stop comparing yourself with others and instead be the man or the woman that God has called you to be in his strength and for his glory. So five headings. Here's number one. Let's look at the ministry of John and Jesus and how it overlapped. The ministry of John and Jesus and how it overlapped. And one more click on the PowerPoint. We're talking about Jesus beginning his ministry. Look again at verses 22 through 24. It says, after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John was also baptizing at Anon near Selim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized for John had not yet been put in prison. Now again, in John chapter 3, we have the story of Nicodemus. We have the story of how the serpent was lifted up on the pole in the wilderness, and everybody was to look to that as a foreshadowing of Christ who would come. We have the most famous verse in the Bible, which is John three sixteen: For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And then here we are towards the end of John 3 where he says, after this, Jesus is now really venturing out into the countryside. He had been in Jerusalem for a while and he's going out into the countryside for a little bit more of a rural ministry, right? A little bit more sparse in the population. And I've always appreciated this about Jesus. I mean, Jesus will go into the town center and Jesus will go out into the middle of nowhere. He, he will be willing to confront the Pharisees at the headquarters of the Jews religion, but he'll also take the gospel to the ends of the earth. I mean, Jesus will talk to big shots like Herod and like Pilate and the high priest Caiaphas, but he'll also talk with nobodies like he did in the next chapter when he talked to the woman at the well in Samaria. He, he personally spoke to blind Bartimaeus. He also interacted with the Syrophoenician woman. Jesus is really not impressed with our status, nor is he turned off by our stench. Jesus loves people, and he loves to minister, and he loves to do the Father's will. And so Jesus is now away from Jerusalem, and he's out in the countryside there in Judea. And then we read, your next click, that John is still continuing his ministry as well. Right, Jesus is out there, and in verse 23, John is baptizing there as well, where the water was plentiful. Right, the exact location of Anon near Salim is somewhere in Samaria on the Jordan River. We also know that the word Anon, that's a Hebrew word, in the, even though it's in the New Testament, it's a Hebrew word that means springs. So we know it's very clear that water was plentiful there in the Jordan so that John could be baptizing as was part of his ministry. And just as a refresher on John the Baptist and all that he was doing, why don't you hold your finger there and look at Mark chapter 1. So you can go over to the left, a couple of books, to Mark, the gospel of Mark chapter 1. And John's, John's doing it, right? This is what John did. He baptized, but also in Mark 1 verse 2, as is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. 
John the Baptist, right? To prepare their way for the Lord. A voice, Mark 1, 3, a voice, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Not that Jesus needed to be straightened out. It just means preparing the way before Jesus so that as he comes, he can come right in and do the very ministry that God had called him to. And so John appeared, Mark 1, 4, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins and all of the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. So John the Baptist was seeing great success, great opportunity to minister to the Hebrew people about how the Messiah is coming and many of them are getting ready. And John was clothed, Mark 1, 6, with camel's hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist, and he ate those locusts with wild honey. And as he preached, and he preached, saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And I, I just love that. We can go back to John, but I just wanted you to see that. That's, that's John the Baptist. That's what he's doing. He's always been about Christ. And he's always been about preparing the way for the Lord. And I love this description about John the Baptist also because he goes against the mold, right? He goes against the grain. He was somewhat unconventional. He was totally obedient to God's calling in his life from Isaiah. He was spirit-led. He was living an abundant and a radical life for Christ and for the gospel. You know, by the way, what would John the Baptist's reward be on this earth? He would be arrested, and he would have his head chopped off and placed on a platter because King Herod had to make that promise to Herodias at that dance, that fateful night. So we don't always get rewarded, do we, for doing faithful ministry for the Lord. But this text in John says he had not yet been put in prison. So before he was arrested and had his head chopped off, we're reading now back in John 3 how we have this incredible ministry of John the Baptist, and we have this incredible ministry of Jesus, and their ministries began to overlap. And I like this point because it just kind of reminds me that we're to never stop doing what God has called us to do, no matter who we overlap with. You know, they plant a new church in town, new ministry starts up, something else is happening, they're kind of doing what you're doing. That's okay. We can work together, right? We can work together or I'll do what I'm doing. They're doing what they're doing. This is kind of John the Baptist. He he could have said, well, my mission is done. Christ is here. I think I'll go on vacation. But not yet because John's going to be faithful to the very end. John, John is ministering. Jesus is ministering. Jesus is calling people to repentance. John the Baptist was still calling people to repentance. Jesus and his disciples were baptizing. John and his disciples were baptizing. In other words, never stop doing what God has called you to do. Men, never stop loving your wives like Christ loved the church. Wives, never stop being that helpmate to your husband. Parents, never stop rearing your children in the teaching and admonition of the Lord. I mean, even when they're older, you still can parent in a way that would be more hands-off, and hopefully they ask you occasionally for advice, right? But you're still there for them, and you're praying for them. Christian, never stop witnessing the gospel to that person at work. We just want to keep being faithful and doing whatever it is that God is calling us to do. And we want to do that until Jesus comes back. This is the setting for what we're looking at. But let's move on to the second heading here. And now we see the crux of the message, the jealousy. Number two, the jealousy of John's disciples. One more click here says there's a debate going on about whose ministry is better. Look at verses 25 and 26. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. Now this whole idea of Jesus' ministry and John's ministry overlapping leads to this discussion or to a debate between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew. In fact, the word for discussion here means a controversy or an engagement in a controversial discussion, debate, or argument. In other words, it got heated. 
It's on. We're having a theological debate about something that we need to know about. And it's very possible that what this particular Jew, who's not identified, wants to know about is whether or not he should be baptized by Jesus or baptized by John. This one Jew is a little bit confused. He's like, we've been following John the Baptist, but now Jesus is here. What do you think I'm supposed to do at this point? Am I, am I supposed to be baptized by Jesus? Is, is his ministry better? Are his disciples more faithful? Should I, should I be baptized by John the Baptist in his ministry? Is it better? Are his disciples more faithful? And so the disciples of John the Baptist, they're kind of upset about it. And they, they feel some loyalty towards the Baptist. And they're like, John, what, what are we supposed to tell this guy? Is something wrong with us? Is, 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 are we to keep doing what we're doing? And Jesus and his ministry at this point are cranking out bigger numbers than John and his ministry. Remember, John used to be the biggest show in town. Everybody came to him to be baptized. Now Jesus has got going and everybody's going to Jesus. The momentum has officially shifted. It used to be all about John's ministry. Now people are leaving town. They're going out into the wilderness, not to hear John the Baptist, but to hear Jesus. So the question is, what happened? What happened to John? Did he lose his influence? Did he lose his mojo? Did he lose his passion? Did he lose his swagger? Did he lose his effectiveness? How is it that John... The Baptist disciples are going to respond to this as they're processing it all. Did they, did, they, did they understand what was going on? Did they send the other ministry a note of congratulations and some flowers? Did they say something to them like, hey, you guys are doing a great job. How can we help you? No, instead they, they get jealous. They think they're on two separate teams instead of on the same team. And as they get jealous, they begin to compare and then they start to compete, and then they began to feel insecure. By the way, this is exactly how we tend to respond in the flesh as well. And did you notice their emotion and their language? He, he, look, he's baptizing, and all are going out to him. Really? Like, everyone is going out to him? Look, John, they said, you embrace this guy. Now everyone is going out to him. It's a little bit of an exaggeration. It's a little bit of an inflated statement. Children are known to do this at times, or at least my kids have over the years. Right? How come he gets all the toys? And I don't get any toys. How come they get to have all the fun and I don't have any fun? How come you're doing this with them and nothing with me? It's not really accurate or true, but it can be how it feels at times. And we can struggle with that same sentimentality as adults. We can feel insecure or overlooked, and we can react in a very similar way. Why does my boss always acknowledge and praise my coworkers, and I never get any of the credit for the success of the organization? Why does everything go right for my friends and my neighbors, but nothing ever goes right for me? Really? Is that, is that really accurate? Everyone else gets everything, and you get absolutely nothing? And yet, that's how it feels sometimes. And so we react to that. We exaggerate things and we tend to inflate things and we overreact. And, and that's what John the disciple, John the Baptist disciples, are doing in this verse. And here's what went wrong for these guys they had misplaced their value. They had began to, to view their value and their worth to God based on their performance instead of based on the fact that they are image bearers and ambassadors for Almighty God. And they had began to place their dignity on the level of their ministry success. And so when the ministry began to suffer a little bit, their pride got hurt and they began to overreact. And when their success was being threatened, they feel that their value was being threatened as well. And so they began to compare. And then they began to compete. And then they began to feel insecure. And they began to say irrational things. And yet, don't we have a tendency to do the same things? We, we value ourselves sometimes based on our own accomplishments. And it really can be difficult to rejoice with those around us who are experiencing further success when we're not. And when our success seems to be eclipsed by other success, we could feel insecure and begin to lash out. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Have you ever been in a season where you were in charge 
and you were in the spotlight, it was your ministry, then all of a sudden you were kind of moved on to a different place and kind of felt like you were laughed, la- la- not laughed at, but left in the shadows and someone else picks up that same ministry and it seems to go, you know, go far beyond what you could have ever done. And instead of saying, well, praise the Lord for being involved in the ministry, hopefully they were just kind of standing on the shoulders of the foundation of those before him. Instead, you get upset and you begin to respond and, and, and you begin to feel unloved and unappreciated. And in that moment, you got to start to think, what's going on now? What's going on in my heart? I mean, the way we react when we feel overlooked or out of the spotlight is the true measure of who you are as a man or as a woman. It's who you are is who you are. It's not about what you do, right? We all struggle with this. We're not alone. We, we always are struggling with comparing ourselves. There's stories about this throughout the Bible. Maybe you remember Joshua. If you want to look at it later, write down Numbers 11, 26 through 30. And there were two other guys prophesying. Joshua gets upset about it. He goes to talk to Moses about it. And Moses says, don't stop them. I wish that all were prophets for my name's sake. So Joshua was struggling with some jealousy back in Numbers. Not only that, but we know that others struggled with jealousy. The disciples of Christ, you can write down Luke 9, 49. Remember when John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he doesn't follow with us. Remember that? And what did Jesus say? He says, don't stop him for the one who is not against you is for you. In other words, don't stop the ministry success of others just because they're not like you. Probably the best known place in the New Testament might be Philippians. If you remember when Paul in the beginning of Philippians chapter 1 talks about how some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill, the latter do it out of love, but knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely thinking to afflict me with my imprisonment. So some did it with the right heart and motive. Some did it with the wrong heart and motive. How did the apostle Paul respond? He says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Now listen, if they're not preaching Christ and it's another ministry that's actually a false gospel, then we're going to go against it, right? Because it's not... The, the gospel. But if it's another ministry that's not exactly like ours, but they hold to the true gospel, this is where we're saying we need to support that. It's about supporting gospel ministry efforts. And notice that in every case, when someone got upset about this, it was typically the understudy who got out of sorts about it, and it was the older, mature person who said, hey, don't worry about it. As long as God is glorified, may he be praised. May their tribe increase. Let's stop debating about whose ministry is better, and instead, let's rejoice with those around us who are experiencing God's blessing in their ministry. Now, let's look next click on the outline there, the debacle of comparison and competition. If you can't learn to do this, it's going to be a debacle. It's actually a a sin. It's the 10th commandment. You could jot down Exodus 20, verse 17, right? You shall not covet your neighbor's house, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Jesus reiterates this 10th commandment in Luke 12, 15, and he said, take care and be on guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So whether it's a physical possession, like we typically think of covetousness, or an abstract desire for success, our hearts are full of covetousness and jealousy and greed. But if our value is in God and not in our popularity as a person or as a couple or as a church, then we don't have to be threatened by other people. The desire to have more and the desire to do more and the desire to be the best known and the, and the desire to be liked and the desire to be in the limelight can be functional slavery. We feel like unless I'm in the show that I'm not worth anything because that's again where you find your value. Let me just remind you this morning that you and I are not in an audition. You are not on trial. You're not here to determine your value before God. You're not here to determine your worth or your dignity. You've been given what you've been given by God. 
namely your salvation. And you're a new creation in Christ. And nothing else matters. you got nothing to prove. Let me make sure you understand what I'm saying by way of further application. You know, we live in a very competitive world. And sometimes in order to get into something like med school or law school or business school, you got to be really competitive. I mean, you need to have like a 4.0 and a high GPA and score well on all the tests. I fully understand when I was trying to get into PA school, there's like a thousand applicants and only 32 were accepted. So I'm not saying don't be competitive. What what I'm saying to you from this text is that in the midst of your fight to get into that program that you want, don't lose perspective. And if you start to find your value or your identity in the ability to make good grades or to get into the school of your choice, then you will destroy yourself because your value is not really on the line. Let's look at how this works. Let's say that you have an ambition to get into med school. And let's say that you get in and now you're in med school. Congratulations, you and all the others are now used to being top dogs and and now you're competing against each other in med school. And let's say that you're struggling to keep your head above water. And if you graduate at the top of your medical class, you know what you are? You are a image bearer and a child of God who works as a doctor. And if you graduate at the very bottom of your medical class, do you know who you are? You are an image bearer and a child of God who works as a doctor. And if you fail medical school and you're kicked out, do you know what you are? You are an image bearer and a child of God who does not work as a doctor. And it's okay. I mean, you might have a big debt. You've got to figure out how to pay that off. There's counseling at this church for you, if that's you, this morning. But I'm just saying, it doesn't really change your Christianity, right? Unless you were being truly a poor steward or whatever, we could talk about that aspect of it. But what I'm trying to say is that ultimately you do what you do for the Lord, and you don't worry about those results, particularly by comparing yourself to one another. I mean, let's say some of you are in your careers already, and you're thinking, compete. Well, I have to do that. I work in sales. I have to beat the other guy, or I don't get paid. I have quotas to meet, and, and I, and I got to be promoted in my job, and, and that's how it works with my annual review with my boss. And if I don't get a good review, then I'll be overlooked and I'll have no future of promoting with this company. And I would say that's all good and fair. Do your best, work hard, but to some degree, you got to just be careful, right? It, it, you can have a good work ethic and give it your very best. And I understand this is capitalism, so we want to be advantageous against another business. But what I am saying is that's not where you place your value and your dignity, and your worth before God. Your value is not determined by your boss or your ability to beat the other guy. You are an image bearer and a child of the king. Stay-at-home moms, where are you on all of this? You might think, well, hey, I'm a stay-at-home mom. I'm not in that dog-eat-dog world, the rat race of the business world, right? But you know that this same temptation can happen to you, And you could be tempted to compare yourself with other moms. I mean, have you ever heard of this website called Instagram? You know what Instagram is? You know what that word means in the Greek? It means demon website. (laughs) It's what they taught us in seminary. I know uh, your pastor told me, uh, Bart told me that Facebook means fake book. You heard him say that before? Facebook is fake book. Here's what I'm getting at. If we're not careful, we know that all of these folks, and I'm not saying you can never post anything on Instagram, but you know what I'm getting at here. Sometimes that people do it just a little bit too much, as if some of these maybe other moms were former NASA engineers or formal general contractors who put together all these do-it-yourself home projects and crafts that are simply amazing. And they prepare these whole grain snacks and foods for their kids that are, of course, organic and healthy for you. And these snacks are beautifully colored. And they're shaped like zebras and elephants and giraffes and rhinos. And these moms take pictures of these exotic celery snacks and and that their kid supposedly loves them and puts it on Instagram, and the picture looks awesome, and the kids look happy, and all the other moms who see it instantly feel like a horrible mom, because you look at your snotty-nosed kid walking around the house with his arm elbow deep in a Cheeto bag, (laughs) and you feel like a failure, right? 
My, I, I didn't have time to prepare these healthy snacks. Look at my kids. What's wrong with them? You know, it can be a challenge at times, right? This is the, it's, it could be a weapon that the devil uses to make moms feel devalued and unsophisticated and losers in their calling. I mean, I, I've seen the posts. Have you seen them? Workout, check. Quiet time, check. House clean, check. Breakfast ready, check. Kids lunch prepared, check. Dinner plans made, check. And it's only 7 a.m., what am I going to do the rest of the day except look at my website and see how many likes I get about what a great mom I am? And the rest of the mortal moms log in around 9 a.m., still in their pajamas, and they see what they see, and they feel like a failure. Moms, can I just encourage you this morning again? I'm not saying never post anything about your family. I'm just saying that your value and your dignity and your worth is not based on if you have worked out or not, or if you have had your quiet time that particular day or not, or if your house is spotless or not, but your worth is based on the fact that you are an image bearer and a daughter of God. And a lot of times, those moms who are posting that stuff on Facebook or Instagram are lying to you. They have it just as tough as you do, right? The other parts of their house is a wreck, and their kids don't even like the healthy snacks. And their workout is a joke. They do like five jumping jacks and two minutes of yoga. Many of these moms are seeking the approval of man more than they are seeking the approval of God. Let me just point out to all of us this morning that this comparison and competitiveness that John's disciples are feeling was not taking place at home or in the workplace. It was actually taking place in the ministry. What are they insecure about? Baptism numbers? How big their ministry was? They were concerned about whether people thought John's ministry was the best or someone else's. They are concerned about how big their church was. So the question is applicable to me, right? Do pastors and ministers and leaders compare and compete with other pastors and leaders? Oh yeah, you bet they do. All of them except for me. We're hor are horrible at this. I'm kidding. You know, we all struggle. I'm telling you, me, Bart, any pastor who's going to be honest would say, yeah, there's times I've felt kind of insecure about my ministry and what's going on around town and what I hear about from other pastors. And pastors can sometimes be the most narcissistic people that you'll ever meet. And of course, pastors have a way of hiding this with their spiritual conversations. So Adam, tell me, brother, how many sheep do you feed there? at Placerita Bible Church every week? How many souls have you been winning for the Lord? Have you been stirring the waters of baptism lately? How many did you have this year? How much money have you raised for the kingdom work and for missions? I mean, that's how some pastors talk, right? And I can fall into this category just as easy as John's disciples can of comparing and contrasting on a regular basis. God help me, right? At the same time, this could be true of an elder team, of a deacon team, a counseling team, a youth team, a, a, a children's ministry team, women's ministry, men's ministry. I mean, we all are in jeopardy of falling into this sin if we're not careful. So let me tell you something, Christian. Your worth and your value and your dignity does not raw, rise or fall with the attendance of those who come to your ministry or with the giving at your church. Your value is found in the fact that you are image bearers of God, and your value is found in the fact that you are a Christian and a child of the King. So don't fall into the debacle of comparing and competing with others. Instead, fall into the joy of coming to the cross and seeing God's love for you and His care for you and the fact that you're not alone and that you have value and worth in Him because He's placed His presence in you. Next click is that we also got to understand there's a desperation, really, of an identity crisis going on. People are so desperate to find their identity that I believe that they are more than ever uh, in an identity crisis. And this happens to churches because it happens to people. Let me just remind you of your identity as a human being. Genesis 1:27 says, God created man in his own image. So the reason that's so important is because that's where it starts, just being a human being. I'm created in the image of God. 
meaning I'm able to have, um, I'm able to have uh, you know, communicable attributes that relate to God because I have a spirit, I have a soul, I have an outer man and an inner man, and my inner man helps me to relate to God. It's in the image of God, Genesis 1.27, that he created them male and female. He created them, and please, nothing in between. I live in California. Come on, I have to say that to my congregation just to remind us because of the culture that we live in. Right? And as a human being, you're more important to God than all of his creation. You are more important to God than galaxies and planets. And you're more important to God than, than suns and solar systems. And you're more important to God than the moon and the stars. And you're more important to God than the mountains and the oceans. And you're more important to God than any plant or any algae or any endangered species. I also have to say that in California. <laughs> they don't have to say that in Kansas, but in California you do, right? People get into all kinds of stuff. But you've got to be reminded you're more important to God than any created thing because you're an image bearer, which means that you are able to be a reflection of your creator in a way that the rest of creation can't be because you can interact with God and point them to God and you have value and worth and identity that's wrapped up in the fact that God created you to be an ambassador for Christ. Because not only are you a human being, you are born again. If you are in Christ this morning, you are recreated in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So now I'm doubly image bearing. In one sense, for God in general, all human beings are image bearers. In a second sense, when I'm born again, I've been created in Christ according to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace we've been saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Oh, don't forget verse 10, which says, for we are his workmanship. The word there is that you are handcrafted. You're his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's what your life's about. As a Christian, that's where you find your, your interest is in understanding that and living that out. And if you're a Christian today, then you've been created in Christ Jesus for good works. And those good works are works of obedience and they're works of grace. And those good works are specifically obeying God's word and specifically applying God's word in your life. So yes, you want to be a good ministry leader and you want to be faithful to the word of God and you want to see success in your ministry and you want to be an awesome mom and you want to be an awesome dad. But most importantly, you want to know that you were created in Christ Jesus so that you can represent him in your church and in your ministry and to your children. Don't forget who you are and don't forget who you represent and don't be overcome with jealousy, but be overcome with joy. That's where this text goes. John's like, you guys are all jealous. We actually ought to all be joyful. Look where it goes. Look at the third heading. Your next heading here, number three, the humility of John the Baptist, because they bring this to John the Baptist. And they're like, help us think through this, John. And in verse 27 and 28, John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. So these words of John the Baptist here in verse 27, these are words of a man who is content. They come to him, John, we got a problem. We're loyal to you. What do you think about these other guys? And John's like, hey, not about me. It's never been about me. He's fully content. John is like, praise God. If they have a good thing going over there, then it's because of the Lord. John the Baptist is not concerned with how big the crowd is, and he's not placing his value in his success. You know why? Because he knows, next click on the outline, he knows that God is sovereign in bestowing those blessings. You have what you have because God gives it and nothing more. God is sovereign in bestowing salvation, John 6, 65, God is sovereign in bestowing authority to governments, John 19, 11, and God is sovereign in bestowing his blessings in ministry as he sees fit. As verse 27 says, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. So John the Baptist is reminding us this morning that we are not 
auditioning for value or importance. No one has anything that didn't come from God. Our salvation is from God. Our authority comes from God. Our gifts come from God. The success of our ministry comes from God. And listen to me, when we really get a hold of that, it frees us from the sin of comparison. Why am I comparing what God gave me to what God gave them? If God wants to give them what he gives them, then praise the Lord. If he gives me what he gives me, this frees us up to actually love other people and to celebrate their success. And we want to learn to model this as husbands and wives and as churches and have great success uh, doing what God wants us to do. It's not just about building bigger buildings and leading bigger ministries. Let's rejoice with those who do if they do it to the glory of God. But we're interested in ourselves in the quietness of our own heart, going after God, finding our contentment in Jesus, and just doing our best to represent him in our little area of the vineyard, no matter what we're into, as long as it's for the Lord, right? Next click says, God is sure to give the increase as he sees fit. That's what these verses are saying, right? It's God who gives the increase. John is essentially saying, hey guys, this is what I've always told you, right? That's what he's saying in verse 28. Look, you're bearing witness here about what I've always told you. I'm not the Christ. I've been sent before him. If you go back to the beginning of the gospel, John chapter 1 verse 6 says that there was John who was to be a witness about the light. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. In John 1 15, he says, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me. This is not a new concept for John. He always knew. It's always going to be about Christ. He ranks before me. In fact, he said in John 1.20, I am not the Christ. In John 1.23, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. In John 1.27, he says, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. That was his attitude. What, compare myself to Jesus' ministry? Compare myself to God's ministry in another vessel? I'm not even worthy to unstrap their sandals, which was the most menial of, of, of roles that they wouldn't even have Hebrew slaves do it. They would have foreign slaves do that because a Hebrew wouldn't dare do that. And John's like, I'm not even worthy to do that. Lots of passages teach this clearly. We don't have time to look at them, but look at 1 Corinthians 3, 3 through 7, talks about jealousy and competition. Remember between Apollos and and between uh, Paul and and some water, some plant, but God gave the growth. And this is where we have to realize that we're, we're really all on the same team. It shouldn't be comparing Christians with Christians. Rather, as Christians, we ought to be linking arms and competing for the souls of men against the devil. Not against each other, but we're competing for God's kingdom on earth. You could jot down 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7. Again, another passage that talks about jealousy and comparison. And we're just saying, don't boast about the success that you have and don't complain about the success that you don't have. Do what you do in the power of the Spirit and let the glory of God take care of the rest. This leads us to our next point here, number four, where John gives this perfect illustration, the illustration of John the Baptist, and one more click says, the church is the bride of Christ. As John continues to give his answer here in verse 29, he says, reminding us all this morning, he says, listen, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. You know what the Baptist is saying? He's saying life is not about you. And everything is about Jesus. It's not about you, it's about Jesus. So we've got to ask ourselves the question as we look at this verse, is my life about me, what I want, or is this life about Jesus and what he's doing? I mean, you're, you're at church right now, so you're off to a good start for this week, but what about on Monday? Or on Tuesday, all the way through Saturday, are each one of those days, do they belong to the Lord where you say every day and every moment, it's all about Jesus, none of it's about me. And here in verse 29, we understand that the church is Jesus' bride, not ours. 
And so John is kind of saying, hey guys, the church belongs to Jesus. It doesn't really belong to us. Remember, this is John's response to his disciples as they're working through the tension in their own hearts as they are feeling insecure and even jealous about Jesus and his disciples. And so John says, listen, it's the one who has the bride that is the bridegroom. And so here we clearly see that Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. And so we also see that the friend of the bridegroom, in verse 29, that's mentioned here, that's a reference to John the Baptist. That's a reference to you and me. That's the role we play. We're not the bridegroom. We're the friend of the bridegroom. So we have a part to play in the work of redemption, but we're not on the center stage. We have a part to play in the game of life, but you're not Michael Jordan. You're Scottie Pippen at best. Right? You're not the bridegroom, you're the bridegroom's friend. Or in today's terminology, you are the best man. You're the best man. What's the best man's job? The best man's job is to act on behalf of the bridegroom and to make the preliminary arrangements for the ceremony. And the best man is also to actually attend to the bride and to make sure she has everything she needs before the bridegroom gets there. And the best man's joy increases when he hears the bridegroom's voice coming for his bride. And the best man is not to take the center stage or to steal the show and not to ever, ever, ever run off with the bride. Jesus is the groom. These people, his people, the church is his bride. And I'm just here, John is saying, to help in any way I can. John the Baptist is saying, that is my great joy to rejoice in Jesus because John loved Jesus and John got his joy from Jesus and John spent his whole life serving Jesus and it brought him joy. That's why he says at the end of verse 29, this very thing that's making you jealous ought to be what's completing your joy. Your joy ought to be complete in the fact that Christ is here. And he's exalting his name in other places and in other churches. And it's okay. It's a good thing. And in Christian circles, it can sometimes sound so cliche, right? In Christian circles, we know it's the right thing to do, but we don't always feel like it. To rejoice when we see other churches or other ministries growing and flourishing. And I really wish that we could... You know, sometimes put our own needs in front of, uh, of, of, of uh, what, what's going on. We think it's all about us and what we think we need in that moment. But you have to understand, it's really, it's just not about you. This is really the paradox of the Christian life that you have to figure out, which is clearly taught throughout Scripture. And the paradox is this. The more you live for yourself and the more that you live for your own joy, then your joy will evade you and your life will be miserable And the more that you die to yourself and you die to your desires and your wants and you live for Jesus in his glory, the more actual joy you will experience in this life. Some of you don't believe me and I would suggest that that's why you're so miserable. You can never have enough. You'll never be satisfied. But those who get this and understand this and live this out in their lives, they know what I'm talking about. I find this paradox to be so true in my own life. The more I try to find my joy in my desires and my wants and my dreams and my goals and my possessions or in my plans, the more frustrated and anxious and upset and impatient and hopeless I feel. But then I look to Jesus and Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So let me ask you this morning, have you found your joy in Jesus? Are you a good best man? Or have you tried to steal Jesus' bride or Jesus' attention or Jesus' accolades by somehow boasting about your own effort? So Jesus is already committing himself to the bride and he's coming again to claim her as his own. Your next click there says, the bridegroom is coming to claim his bride. I think that you already saw that on maybe on number four. The bridegroom's coming to claim his bride. We don't have time, but Lord, 
knows that Revelation 19 about the second coming is about as glorious as it gets in the Bible of Christ coming back to take his bride home. That's the eternal perspective we're supposed to have. Let's move on now to number five. The last thing I want to show you is the thrust of John the Baptist here in verse 30, which he says, he must increase, but I must decrease. And I just want to make the point to your attention. There's actually three musts in the chapter here. There's three musts, just a quick review. There was the must of the sinner. In John 3, 7, he said to Nicodemus, do not marvel. I said to you, you must be born again. Number two, there's the must of the Savior. John 3, 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The third must is this one in verse 30. He must increase and I must decrease. You know what he's saying? This is not optional. If you keep exalting yourself over others, it may be that you're not saved. Because salvation is about humility. He must become greater in our hearts and in our minds. And we must become less and less. Hide me behind the cross, O Lord. This is the anthem of anyone who has ever beheld Jesus and considered what he has done for you. It is a look at Jesus as, as, as who he is. Who he really is, the bridegroom coming from his church. He's not just a historical figure. He's not just a religious icon. He is the savior of the world and the true bridegroom coming for his church. And if you behold him for who he is, you'll never be the same. And you'll find your contentment in him. Who is Jesus? He's your creator. Who is Jesus? He's your savior. Who is Jesus? He's the lover of your soul, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He's the redeemer. He's your advocate. He's your bridegroom. He is your joy. And so the thrust of your life and my life should not be comparing ourselves to others and then competing with others or living a life of insecurity. The thrust of our life should be committing ourselves to Christ and and, and saying, I can't, but he can. I must decrease, he must increase. It should be about coming to the cross and loving Jesus more by loving yourself less. That's what God's called us to. So the take home of this message, just a few application points. Number one, where do you find your value, your worth, and your dignity? Where do you find it? Is it in your job, in your credentials, in your family? While you may be blessed with wonderful things, I hope you find it in Christ and in Him alone. Number two, if you struggle with the sin of comparison, what's the way out? We've seen in our text this morning, the way out is joy in Jesus. It's in him. Be thankful. Be grateful. Rejoice and celebrate with all those who come home to Christ. Number three, do you believe the paradox that we're talking about here at the end? Or do you live your life and your joy, the more joy, uh, do you live for your life and your joy, like your own joy? And if you do that, the more your joy will evade you. It will evade you. You can't find satisfaction by having success in whatever you're seeking success in. You can only find satisfaction by looking to Christ, exalting Him, loving Him, being content in Him. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So if you're struggling with the sin of comparison like I do, may God help use this text to remind you, you are not the bridegroom. You're the best man. You're the maid of honor, if you want to say it that way. But you know, you are on the side, helping out in any way you can, putting Jesus in his ministry above your own. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be together in your, in your church here. It's where the people are the church, God, and we're just thankful that we have the opportunity to listen to John the Baptist really taking us to school today and, and, and showing us the attitude we all ought to have, that it's not about me and it's not about my ministry It's about Christ and his glory being on display through the furtherance of the gospel, through whatever lips utter his name truthfully. And I pray, God, that you would help this church, help our church back in California, help us as Christians to take to heart what we've learned and to to become less. We must decrease so that you must increase. Complete our joy as we seek to do that this week and throughout our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.